discuss conflict and the role that it plays in interpersonal communication and interpersonal relationships. So to start off, let's define conflict and talk about what it is, what it isn't. Uh, conflict is an expressed struggle between two interdependent parties involving the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference. So let's uh, look at these couple words that I've highlighted, first of all. So conflict is an expressed struggle. What we mean by that is that conflict cannot be a secret. It cannot be a one-sided affair. Uh, for it to be defined as conflict, uh, both parties have to be aware of it. It has to be something that has been expressed between the two parties as a source of uh, disagreement or, or an issue. If it's just one person that is aware, not not a conflict. So conflict is an expressed struggle between interdependent parties. What that means is that these two parties are connected in some way. That what one does affects the others, uh, and affects the other in the relationship. And uh, so it's not between two strangers, really. I mean, you can have disagreements and, and you know, fight uh, two strangers, but that's not interpersonal conflict. Interpersonal conflict exists within the context of a relationship between two interdependent parties whose actions are uh, affected by one another and, and whose actions affect one another. It also involves at least the perception of these three things that are listed here, incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference. Now note I've highlighted perception because it doesn't even have to exist. Maybe your goals aren't incompatible, but you think they are. Your perception is that they are incompatible and that only one of you can achieve what you want, or you 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 perceive that there are scarce resources, even though maybe unbeknownst to you they are not scarce resources. They are they're abundant resources and readily available, but you don't know that. You think that they are scarce. So the perception of these things, uh, as well as the reality of these things, of course, could uh, uh, be involved in in conflict. It doesn't have to be an actuality. It just has to be something that that the people involved believe is true. So conflict is a, is an express struggle between interdependent parties involving the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference. So just keep that in mind as we go through and talk about conflict a little further. So there are essentially five conflict management strategies that, uh, that are used in interpersonal communication or used effectively in interpersonal communication. So all of these could potentially be effective, but uh, but some of them obviously have major uh, disadvantages and others have major advantages, and so you need to be very careful in choosing the right conflict manage management strategy for this any particular situation. So the first we'll talk about is avoiding, and, and avoiding is probably the least effective management strategy because essentially you're doing exactly what that says. You're, you're avoiding the issue, which also means usually avoiding the other person, so your relationship tends to suffer. This is what we call a lose-lose conflict management strategy because you're, both parties are losing. Neither party's getting what they want out of it, first of all. Neither party's yeah, achieving the goal that they have in mind uh, at the outside of this conflict. So nobody's getting what they want, and you have the potential of losing this relationship as well. So for both parties, it's a lose situation, which makes it a lose-lose situation. Then you also have accommodating, and accommodating can be a double-edged sword. Uh, accommodating is essentially where we let the other person have, you know, get what they want out of the situation. So it's what we call a lose-win uh, strategy. You lose, the other person wins. You give them what they want. And so uh, this can have advantages and disadvantages in a relationship. It really depends uh, as much as anything on the mindset of the uh, of your mindset of the person who's giving that uh, what they want to the other person. So if you're doing that out of a sense of, um, of of wanting the other person to have what they want, or maybe it's just not as important to you and you can tell it's more important to the other person, or you're willing to to sacrifice, you're being benevolent in that situation. You know, you're truly just giving with an open heart and, and a, you know, friendly uh, exchange there, then that can be really positive for a relationship. It, it, you know, it can show the other person that you care for them and that, that you're willing to sacrifice for them and give up what you want for their benefit, and that can be great. On the other hand, if you're doing it out of a sense of martyrdom or a sense of um, being forced to do so, then that can really start to build some resentment. If you're if you're giving into the other person because you feel forced to, or because you you know not because you want to, but because you for whatever reason feel like you have to, then that can really build, start to build resentment and start to have an impact negatively on the relationship. So uh, so you know if you're opening that door for that person, consider your reasons, your rationale for 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 letting that person go through first and get what they want and and have the win. But so it could be good, could be bad. So we have accommodating, which is lose win. Then you have competing, which is uh, typically win-lose, assuming you win the competition. Uh, there's always the risk that you won't. But uh, So again, competition has both uh, positive and negative potential impacts on a relationship. Um, the positive would be, you know, you theoretically getting what you want, and there is resolution. You're not avoiding it, so you're, you're engaging that situation. And, and uh, But the potential for um, 
resentment afterwards. The other person doesn't get what they want, and in the meantime, you've you've beaten them in some way, either either through some sort of power, usually either physical power or intellectual power or positional power or whatever it is. You've you've used that power against this person and won the competition, and that can lead to some resentment, some hard feelings on the part of the other person. So we call this a win lose, but that could develop into or potentially develop into a lose-lose because you may end up losing that relationship. You may, what we call, win the battle but lose the war. You may win that particular conflict, but you may sacrifice in the end that relationship if the, if the other person is feeling burnt enough by that. So so sometimes you can't avoid competing. If there truly are scarce resources, not enough to go around, and you both really want what's there and you're going after it, then, I mean, there's, there's you know, if nobody's willing to give in, then that's, that's a situation where competition may be necessary. If you're competing because you feel like the other person is putting themselves in danger or uh, potentially in danger, then then there's really no avoiding it. So sometimes conflict is unavoidable, but or, and competition is unavoidable. But if there's another option, uh, it probably would be best to explore that. Next, we have uh, the conflict management uh, strategy of compromising, and we say compromising, and everybody says, "Oh yes, compromise! It's so good! It's great! It's not as good as it sounds." Mostly because of a of a uh, misunderstanding of that word as much as anything. When we say compromise, compromise is a partial win-win, but that also means it's a partial lose-lose, because in compromise, both parties give up some of what they want and get some of what they want. So you're getting a little bit of what you want, but you're not getting the whole thing. So in the end, sometimes compromise can lead to, again, some resentment long-term. If I only get part of what I want, I get half of what I want. I may be pleased in the meantime, but uh, in, the, in the short term, but uh, but in the long term, I may start thinking, you know, I didn't get everything that I wanted, and that person really kept me from having what I wanted and what I should have had in this situation. And so in the long term, it can, again, lead to some resentment, conflict further down the road. It may present more of a band-aid than a cure to a situation. But again, depending on the situation, compromise can be an effective conflict management strategy. But, you know, as this picture kind of in the graphic here kind of indicates, some you're both getting some of what you want, but there's a part for each person that's left out there, and that's not a part of this solution. So you're not getting 100% of what you want, which could be an issue long term. So, so we have compromise. What gives compromise such a good reputation is that a lot of people uh, think of compromise. They use the word compromise, and what they really mean is collaborating. Where and collaborating is win-win, where we, where both parties get everything that they want. So both parties are achieving 100% of their goal. They're working together. They're finding a solution. They're coming up with something that allows both of them to have, uh, in the end, 100% of what they wanted coming into that situation. Now, that sounds wonderful, and so you may be saying, well, why don't we just do that all the time? Well, collaborating is difficult. First of all, it's time-consuming, and it requires a lot of energy, and, and can be can be a challenge in that way. Secondly, sometimes you just there's not enough to go around. If it's a truly scarce resource, then there's only so much to go around, and not all the time can everybody get everything that they want. So collaborating doesn't work all the time, and so we engage in some of these other strategies as well. But but when it's an option, it's probably the best option because it, it does present more of a cure than a Band-Aid. Compromise is sort of a Band-Aid. Uh, even competing is sort of a Band-Aid. It solves things temporarily, but in the long term can have uh, worse effects. So, uh, But collaborating typically when it's an option, uh, when it's a really viable option, uh, can be effective because it's, it presents more of a cure. So in collaborating, again, it's only collaborating if everybody gets what they want, which sometimes we think, again, we say, oh, well, we'll work together and we'll get what we want, and that's compromise. No, that's not compromise. That's collaborating. You're working together so everybody gets what they want and everybody gets what they need out of that situation. That's collaborating. That's not compromising. And compromise, by definition, everybody gives up some of what they want. So compromise gets a better reputation than it deserves because it's borrowing from collaborating, and we just don't use that word. But, again, collaborating can be wonderful. It can also be a challenge because of the things that, you know, the time that it requires, the energy that it requires, and the fact that it may not work because there may not be enough resources to go around or whatever. Um, so th that can be an issue as well. But when it's an option, it's probably the best option. So just to give you another uh, idea of uh, what these kind of look like. and uh, So here we have these five conflict management strategies on a scale. On one axis, we have concern for self, and on another, we have concern for others. So you can see where these kind of lay out, and collaborating is the highest on both. It both has both a high degree of concern for us, as well as a high degree of concern for others, and demonstrates that concern for others as well. And you can see where those others lay out there as well. Just another kind of graphic representation of how those lay out in that regard. 
So some of the characteristics of interpersonal conflicts and things to keep in mind. First of all, conflict is natural. It happens in every relationship, whether it would, it's, if you've been in a relationship, friendship, romantic relationship, any kind of relationship for more than five minutes, you know that there's going to be conflict. It's not a matter of if you have conflict. It's a matter of when and how you handle it. Conflict has content, relational, and procedural dimensions. What that means is the content relation is what we're arguing about. It's what the conflict is actually about. Relational has to do with what's our relationship with that other person. Is this our best friend? Is this our boss? Is this our spouse? Is this our child? What's our relationship with them? And that will dictate kind of how, really, how this conflict sort of plays out and some of the rules that are going to be involved there. And then the procedural dimension has to do with how we will actually engage in this conflict. Will we be shouting? Will we be talking calmly? Will we be using physical force or will, you know, will we be threatening people with losing their jobs or whatever? There are procedural dimensions that dictate then what the procedures will be for that conflict as well. Conflict can be direct or indirect. Sometimes we're very upfront with it. Other times we get a little more behind the scenes and, and may engage in what we call passive aggressive behavior, which is not really helpful or healthy uh, for the relationship or the situation, either one. So um, typically better to be direct, but conflict can be direct or it can be indirect. Conflict can be harmful. Obviously, it can, it can harm a relationship, but it can also be beneficial. We can learn more about the other person. We can strengthen our relationship. We can learn more about what that person wants and needs in those situations. So um, it can be beneficial as well. Again, depending on how it's handled and, and how it's handled on those three axes, content, relational, and procedural dimensions. So but conflict can be harmful or beneficial depending on how we handle it and what this is quickly here. Um, personal criticisms. Nobody likes to be you know, called names or, or criticized, so personal criticisms oftentimes develop into conflict. Finances, especially in, in, in long-term relationships, can be a source of uh, a conflict, tr trigger conflict, and household chores, probably not surprisingly, are another source, a common source of conflict. Some other sources of, of conflict and conflict triggers when people feel entitled or, or act or feel as though someone is acting as though they're uh, entitled. That triggers conflict a lot of times. A perceived lack of fairness can trigger conflict. Uh, when there are more perceived costs or rewards to a situation or a relationship, that can trigger conflict. Uh, when we just come from different perspectives and view things differently, uh, when we have a lack of stress, a lack of uh, rest or stress in our lives, that can make us more so. Uh, uh, subject to uh, conflict or more susceptible to conflict. Uh, and then when there's dialectical tension, uh, then that will also trigger conflicts, uh, those, those types of situations. So some things that conflict is affected by, uh, it's affected by sex and gender. Sex and gender, again, through socialization and, and the way that we're taught to perceive these things, uh, will engage in conflict differently and tend to see conflict differently. Our culture certainly will affect uh, conflict. Uh, individualistic cultures tend to be much more direct in their conflict, whereas collectivistic cultures tend to be more subdued or indirect in their conflict. So uh, that will definitely affect conflict in a major way. Online communication affects conflict, uh, particularly through the disinhibition effect, um, the, the way that we treat other people online, and, and the fact that the disinhibition effect causes us to lower inhibitions and, and tends us to make us a little more brave when we're on the other side of screens. Certainly affects conflicts and, and uh, tend, tends to uh, bring out conflict more in in people a lot of times that one might not otherwise. Uh, four co toxic conflict behaviors, what we call the four horsemen of conflict, are, are criticism. These are things you really want to avoid in, in conflict when you're engaging in conflict. Criticism, uh, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling are not productive or healthy behaviors in conflict and, and should be avoided at all costs. So what do we do if we want to manage our conflict in a collaborative way? This is specifically for a collaborative conflict management. First of all, you need to define your needs, explain you know what it is you need, uh, and then share that with the other person. You need to define it for yourself and understand for yourself what it is, and then you need, be, need to be able to express that to the other person in a positive way. You need to set a time aside and say, can we talk about this sometime? Don't ambush the person, don't go after them, don't attack them, but uh, find a time that's appropriate for you to share your needs with that person. Then, just as you've had an opportunity to share your needs, you also be you need to be willing to listen and, and listen well and listen effectively, engage in active listening to that person's needs. You need to find out what it is they need because, again, collaboration involves both of you getting what it is you want. So you need to understand not only your needs, but their needs as well. Then you go through the process of generating possible solutions. You're just brainstorming, throwing out ideas here. Then you evaluate those possible solutions and choose the best one. You implement that, but then you also need to follow up with that solution. Is this working? Is it doing what we had hoped? If not, let's go back to the drawing board and try one of these other things. Um, again, collaboration is time consuming. It consumes a lot of energy, so it's, it's not always going to be manageable or, or practical. But when it is, it's probably the best option. 
If you have questions about conflict or any other topic, please feel free to email me. I always enjoy emailing with you, so please feel free to hit me up via email. And uh, thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions.